All right, so we are back to some decks. And this week, we're taking a look at a little uh, lesser known deck, I guess you could say. Uh, it's not exactly tier one or tier S or whatever you want to call it, but it is nonetheless super fun to play. And that is Sejuani and Swain. So before we get into that, as always, my name is Justin, also known as Shit Just Works. If you are new to the channel, do not forget to hit that subscribe button. And I got a uh, an announcement to make real quick as well. And that is that, yes, it is confirmed. I will be casting this weekend, Duels of Runeterra. I'm pretty sure it's number nine. I think that's right. If not, correct me in the comments below with my boy, Cero, we're going to be doing it up all weekend, Saturday, starting at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, for Swiss rounds one through six, and then same time on Sunday for round seven and eight, as well as the top 16. Also, as always, you'll find a link in the description to myself and Rough House Plays podcast going live Monday mornings at 4 a.m. on all your podcast outlets, Apple, Google, whatever the heck you want to call it, whatever you're using. We got you. So enough about that. What is the Sejuani Swain deck, you ask? Well, if you're looking for a deck that has a lot of little mini combos all worked into the, the deck itself, uh, and it's more of like a mid-range type deck, uh, you're in the right spot because this deck is right up that alley. So stick around. We're going to go through the deck and two games. All right, and here we have it. This deck is honestly super fun. It's definitely not the, you know, best deck on the list of decks. Obviously, you got Ezreal, Karma, Karina Control, stuff like that. But uh, oddly enough, or funny enough, this does sort of wreck Karina Control when it's played properly, uh, mainly because of this, uh, not Ruthless Later, Ember Maiden, deal one to everything, wreck spider tokens, among other things. Uh, but before we get into all that, let's let's go over the general strategy of the deck. The general strategy of the deck is to buff units early on in the game. Obviously, outlast, you know, any aggro that might come, you know, your way. Burn aggro decks, I will say. Burn aggro is always a hard matchup. Uh, you got to really make sure you're not taking any damage whatsoever. Uh, if you are able to make it through that early game, you should have no problem uh, winning out, actually, before they kill you, really, with this deck. Uh, as far as the ultimate strategy and longer matchups, you're looking to eventually get Leviathan or Tusk Raider off, which are behemoths of cards. Like, look at it. Plunder, double the power and health of out. Like, what the, what? <laughs> so, if you actually get that off, everything in your deck becomes pretty nuts. Uh, Wolf Rider allows you to actually ramp up towards getting those eight drops down as well late game. Um, once you get a Wolf Rider off, it always feels super, super good. Just got to make sure you're plundering. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen people forget that they did not plunder that turn and will therefore not get the plunder effect. Swain and Sejuani are obviously pretty good in their own right. Now, it's interesting in the late game, you'll be relying on Swain or Sejuani really depending on the matchup. Uh, both are good to finish off the game. Swain dealing three when he Nexus strikes and Sejuani obviously just inherently having overwhelm in the first place to deal that damage. Um, so it kind of depends on what your opponent's board state is like and what their overall strategy is. So some of those nifty combos I was talking about. All right, well, first off, Omen Hawk is the dream here, all right? Omen Hawk on first turn is amazing. Why? Because you, you have a pretty decent chance of hitting a Crimson Disciple or a Ruthless Raider or even Ember Maiden or Wolf Rider are pretty good targets as well. Now, I only mentioned the low cost ones because obviously those are the ones that you're looking to hit with Omen Hawk early on to really start pressuring your opponent. Sure, if you hit a Swain or a Sejuani or a Leviathan or whatever, it's not half bad either, but you're not going to be able to play them for a little bit. Uh, and again, that's why we have the Wolf Rider in here to kind of help us ramp up towards that a little faster. Now, Omen Hawk on something like a Crimson Disciple is so good. Uh, three attack, four health puts her in a in a zone that makes her very difficult to kill. I feel like a broken record having mentioned that whole three to four health threshold. I think it's a very big deal. That's why Yasuo at four health is now pl more playable than he was previously. One step ahead of the past. So getting that on her is a very big deal. Ruthless Raider, obviously not a bad target as well. Ruthless Raider, honestly, the biggest deal with her is that she combos so well with so many cards in this deck. So you have things like Transfusion. She's a great Transfusion target. It literally just turns Transfusion into a 
burst speed two cost plus two plus two because it doesn't do any damage to ruthless raider so that always feels amazing uh and in addition to that ember maiden if you do need to play it to get rid of spider tokens for corinna or something like that it uh, doesn't feel bad to play a unit you can still play a ruthless raider and not have to worry about your field getting tanked same thing with crimson disciple you can drop a crimson disciple sure she loses one health but in all reality you don't really mind because it deals two damage to the opponent's nexus with that said, Elixir of Iron is obviously a three of in this deck. It helps protect all of your followers. It helps you get more triggers on Crimson Disciple. Uh, it just does a lot for this deck. With Ember Maiden as an example, if you want her to do more than just the two triggers because she'll kill herself, obviously you can always pop a quick Elixir of Iron and it essentially equates to a two damage AOE against your opponent. Culling Strike, super underrated card. Oh my God, kill a unit with three or less power. This feels like a really good card right now with the most recent set having come out. There's a lot of targets that you'll want to kill with this. This card is great. It is a great reason to be in Noxus right now. Death's Hand and Shared Spoils both also kind of support uh, two different strategies here. Death's Hand allows you to get more triggers for Plunder, more triggers for uh, Sejuani and Swain with their level up. And Shared Spoils kind of adds to that whole Omen Hawk idea of, all right, let's buff the top few units in our deck to really just start off super, super aggressive. Uh, shared Spoils also helps in the aggro matchup as, again, your units will be a little bit bigger. will be able to chunk block a couple more times than usual, uh, which should be the difference in damage that you're going to need above your aggro opponent. And if you hit an overwhelmed person, a lot of times you can actually aggro the aggro deck. You can get them killed before they kill you. So with that said, I'm not going to get into the champions too much. Champions are pretty straightforward and self-explanatory, as are their cards that pick them from the decks. They're just diesel cards with really good effects. So let's just get into the gameplay. All right, honestly, I'm not 100% positive what the heck my opponent's playing. It's like a mishmash of champions there. But hey, more power to my opponent. I give anybody credit who tries thinking up some new deck ideas. So I'll never hate on somebody for that. So more power to you. Um, like I mentioned... Omen Hawk is the dream here. Very happy to see it in the first hand. Probably should have kept Transfusion. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I ended up getting a Leviathan in its place. But Transfusion is also another good first draw, especially if you have a Raider in hand uh, to pretty much get the one damage for free. So you're not having to damage your own unit. Also feels decent on Crimson Disciple. So we do have a Crimson Disciple in our hand. We probably could have kept it, no problem. Um, at this point... We are going to want to get both Omen Hawks down. Uh, we want to try to buff as much as we can the units that are on the top of our deck before our opponent gets anything set up. It uh, looks like, you know, they're playing some sort of shroom type deck. I think they actually end up uh, throwing the Puff Cap Peddler down on the following turn. So that is something that I need to be aware of throughout the game so that too many shrooms don't make it into my deck. Uh, so right away I'm thinking okay that culling strike is probably looking pretty good on that puff cap peddler but the second that I draw wolf rider the only thing going through my head is how do I get wolf rider off and that is generally what you want to be thinking um, I will say so you can see death's hand and the wolf rider in my hand right now what you kind of want to set yourself up for which I did not do properly on this turn is saving three spell mana going into turn four so that you can play death's hand and then also play wolf rider on the same turn to basically guarantee that you get the plunder effect off now i know that i have elixir of iron in my hand now anyway so like theoretically i should have saved the mana prior to that i lucked out and drew the elixir of iron the elixir of iron means that pretty much no matter what i'm going to be getting some sort of damage through with that crimson disciple meaning I'm definitely going to get this Wolf Rider off. So I lucked out, drew the Elixir of Iron, definitely uh, very good for me. If I did not draw that, he would have just pegged it off with the Get Excited. And I would have been in a tough spot, not going to lie. Um, you know, the Wolf Rider is a 6-5. That helps a ton. Again, you can see the power of Omen Hawk really shining in this deck. And the other reason why Omen Hawk's so good in this, similar to why Omen Hawk was good with Elusives, it's good with elusives because you know you're going to poke that damage through because it's elusive units. They're probably not going to get blocked. With this, they're all overwhelmed. Or not all, but most of your units have overwhelm. So a lot of times you're hitting an overwhelm unit with the Omen Hawk. So not only are you getting a beefier unit on board, you're getting additional damage with that. So now you're not just getting, you know, plus two, plus two value with Omen Hawk for the two units that it buffs plus one, plus one. You're getting plus two, plus two. 
and you're probably getting two or three damage as well uh, for the overwhelmed if it hits an overwhelmed unit. That's a lot of value in a one cost card. That is insane. Okay, you can see we also hit a Crimson Disciple here. So literally, like this is this is all the dream. This is what you want <laughs> with this deck. This is exactly what you want to happen. A four five, especially both Omen Hawks hit it. That's incredible. A 4-5 Crimson Disciple is like not much that's going to really be able to deal with this without at least taking two damage. Uh, except, unless he has like a Thermo Beam that he uses, you know, all five damage on or possibly more. Uh, obviously, he's at three mana right now. That's not going to happen. But it puts my opponent in a really tough spot because you can see he's already going to take three from the Overwhelm from the Wolf Rider. He's going to take at least two from the Crimson Disciple. He ends up blocking with the Puff Cat Peddler. So now I don't even have to use the calling strike as pro or as preemptively as I figured because it my crimson disciple forced him to block uh, with the puff cap peddler. So now I just decide to use it on the second puff cap peddler mainly because I'm trying to be mana efficient at this point. You know I had so much mana, especially from playing that wolf rider. I kind of want to be spending it so that I'm not wasting or burning mana on my opponent's next turn. Um, I am obviously going to be playing the Leviathan coming up here as well, going into turn eight. So I do decide to not play the Death's Hand on the um, Jesus. I always forget. I always want to say chump, clump of wumps. There's too many chumps and wumps and stuff going on with these pump caps. So um, I did know I was going to float the three spell mana. So I saved the Death's Hand. Uh, I know I'm going to play the Leviathan. And because I floated the three spell mana, now drawing into that Culling Strike is huge. Because it's huge. Uh, all I, I even think of Trump whenever I say huge. Uh, <laughs> is I can culling strike the Heimerdinger. So you can see right there. That's a perfect example as to why it's so important to actually float spell mana as much as possible. The only thing I would have gained by playing the Death's Hand on the previous turn is killing the Chump Womp and doing one damage to the Nexus. And getting like an extra level um, or progress towards the, the level up of Sejuani and Swain. That just doesn't... It's not worth it because then he would have had the Heimer get him at least one or two turrets on that turn uh, because I wouldn't have had a I wouldn't have had the mana for the calling strike or if I did calling strike still I would have had to wait an additional turn to get the Leviathan out there which honestly seeing how the rest of this game plays out it probably wouldn't have mattered I probably still would have ended up killing him it just would have take one turn longer but you can see the difference in how cards are played and how the game unfolds just based on deciding to float the spell mana don't just always go after the immediate play that looks great so we end up winning that game and we go into this second game against a karma ash deck we end up i mean we drew the sejuani first you almost always never want to keep sejuani or swain uh, so we do mulligan the sejuani away and oh my god this hand so Generally speaking with this deck, this is the type of hand you always want. And the Wolf Rider just, just nailed it. Like this, this curve right here is minus Omen. Like Omen Hawk is the only thing that would make this more ridiculous. But this is very, very good. You're drawing all your low cost cards early. You're going to be able to get them all down very quickly and start pressuring the opponent quickly. Um, and that's one of the things I like about this deck is you can kind of go one of two ways. You can play into the later game. Um, and try to get the Sejuani and the Swain and the Leviathan and stuff like that. Or you can play super aggressive early with, you know, Wolf Rider and, and other things that all have Overwhelm. And you have Crimson Disciple that if you get multiple triggers, all of a sudden your opponent is way lower on Nexus Health than they were expecting to be. So there is two uh, inherently different play styles that you can actually, you know, do with this deck. And you can see right here, as we were going through the, the you know, deck description we actually get that combo i was talking about off but unfortunately he has the avalanche you know it's not not fun um i do decide to save all right the reason i do not save the i can't remember the freaking girl that the ember maiden got it nailed it the reason i decide to just toss the uh the ember maiden is because his unit was gonna die anyways the ice fell archer and that was really the only incentive to me keeping the Maiden was for her to trigger her effect and kill the Archer. Uh, if I were to have saved her, she would have ended up killing herself. And then you can see right here too, she wouldn't have done anything against um, against the Rhyme Fang Wolf, especially because I believe he ends up using a Frostbite pretty soon. So that's why I ended up keeping the other unit. 
Um, I do eventually now draw into the Omen Hawk. This Omen Hawk is going to help immensely. It also allows me to pass priority back over to my opponent right here, uh, which you'll see in a second, which means that they are now having to make the first decision with less mana. Uh, this is something you definitely want to take into consideration in games. You know, a lot of times you have the advantage by like, see, he just spent five mana. A lot of times you have the advantage in getting your opponent to spend their mana first, especially if they feel like they have to. Because now I know, okay, I have seven mana. I got two units on board. This board state is really not going to change much, all right? Because they only have one mana. There's only so many cards that can play at one mana. And with Freljord and Ionia, that's really just Elixir of Iron. Um, there's some other ones Ionia has, but I highly doubt he's playing those cards, right? So now I know I can get the plunder effect off. I can play the Wolf Rider. And now I have a super, super, super duper advantage um, having the extra mana. My hand is looking great with the culling strike. And again, with the Z combo, uh, you can see here getting the free transfusion feels so good. And now it puts me in a position where he either has to do something or his unit dies. And even if he does do something, I still have culling strike. And again, this is why I love calling strike. And now because he doesn't do something, I can sit back on my calling strike and kill this Rhyme Tusk Shaman, which like I just cannot express how great this card is right now. I think it's going to get way better in this meta too. Calling strike just seems to be so good, especially even against aggro, right? You're playing against a Boom Crew Rookie or something like that. Boom Crew Rookie at four health. It's always a pain in my ass. I'm sure it's a pain in everybody's ass that's watching this video, right? Using it on Boom Crew Rookie feels very, very good early on uh, in the game. As long as they're not overrunning you with other stuff, of course. But um, all right, so we've we've basically made it to the late game here. We're on turn eight. Turn eight is where you want to start thinking about playing Leviathan and stuff. And honestly, our board is so far ahead of our opponent right now. I mean, the, we don't even need the Leviathan, all right? But we have the Leviathan, so you can trust. We play in that shit, all right? We we are going all out. Uh, the Leviathan's buff too. My opponent ends up surrendering. There just ain't no coming back from that, man. There's just no coming back from that. All right, guys, that is it. That is Sejuani and Swain. So I really hope you guys try this deck out and not the aggro video that I made. I'm like regretting making that video because that deck is like cancer. I know I don't like playing against it. I know nobody else likes playing against it. So this is my formal apology, but, but try this deck out. This deck is super fun. Uh, it's it's good enough to be able to try to ladder with it as well. So I highly suggest this deck if you're trying to switch it up. And you're tired of playing Ez Karma, tired of playing Aggro, tired of playing Deep Monsters. You know, just really throw people off their game, right? So anyways, as always, everybody stay healthy, stay positive. I hope shit just works for you and peace out.